Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll start uh, now with a little bit of delay uh, to uh, give people a chance to get down from the plenary session. Um, and this afternoon, we'll spend until half past four now uh, talking about finance, innovation, and policy for green growth in the transport sector. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, particularly the energy sector so far. Uh, and now we'll turn to what's perhaps the second biggest sector uh, when it comes to environmental impacts and investment requirements. So very much at the core of the green growth strategy debate. We have uh, three very distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Singhal, who's director of the Institute of Urban Development in, uh, in Delhi, advisor to the government, to the Ministry of Urban Development, and more generally to the government. Uh, we have Yehak Oh, who's the vice president of the Korean Transportation Institute here in uh, Seoul. And we have uh, Mr. Yutea, who's the Under Secretary of State uh, in the Ministry of uh, Public Works and Transport in Cambodia. So we have uh, a nice uh, spread of, of different environments for discussing the green growth uh, investment climate. Uh, we, were we should have had uh, a speaker from Veolia Transport, who is a very important uh, private sector partner for governments. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, they were not able to be with us today. Uh, at the last minute, there was a problem with illness in the family. So they have nevertheless sent in a set of bullet points, um, which I can talk about a little later in the afternoon if we have uh, time in relation to private uh, participation in the sector. Uh, so I think what I'd like to do is uh, we have um, two presentations. Two of the speakers have presentations uh, with a PowerPoint. Uh, and so we'll start with one of those. We'll start with uh, Mr. Singhal, um, talking about uh, the strategies for investment, particularly in the urban transport environment in India, which is such a vast uh, country. It really has environments covering the whole range from uh, very low income to moderate income and a very rapidly growing middle class now. So if we can start with you, um, there's a podium over there and your slides will uh, come up. And uh, I will take interventions from all of you in the audience. Uh, uh, the microphone's up there and there's a, um, a button for controlling the slides, a red and green button for forward and backwards. And I will, I will bring in you in the audience uh, after this first presentation. So. Uh, please be ready to put your hand up and uh, come into the discussion. Panelists, ladies and gentlemen, this subject of green growth has been the subject of very intensive deliberations in India in the recent past. And uh, they have covered all aspects of this thing. We have, in, we have estimates of the investments needed how to finance it, what policy interventions are needed, and how to use technology. So I'm in my presentation, I'm going to show you the conclusions and the guidelines that we have arrived at. These deliberations have taken place at a very high level in the government. These recommendations have gone in, and uh, um, the, the final documents have to come out. And as Stephen said, I'm going to be speaking only on urban transport. Before I get into those initiatives, I want to list out the four steps which the government of India has already taken in this direction. In 2005, the urban renewal mission was introduced because development of cities was lagging. And so they felt that cities need renewal. It provides financial support to upgrade services in cities and to implement projects, including in urban transport. It funded implementation. In 2006, the National Urban Transport Policy was issued. And it had two main objectives. Equitable allocation of road space, that means if buses carry more people, then they should get correspondingly that much road space, and growth of sustainable transport. 
In 2008, the Sustainable Urban Transport Project was launched by the government jointly with the World Bank and the UNDP. It's a US dollar 300 million project with two main objectives, capacity building. And second, there were five demonstration projects around the country to bring about a paradigm shift in planning urban transport. The implementation started in 2011 and Completion is by December 2014. And the fourth step taken by the government is to set up a national mission on sustainable habitat. Uh, and it has developed guidelines for sustainable habitat, including urban transport. Now, coming to the most recent uh, deliberations, three different studies have, under, have estimated an investment requirement in urban transport of more than US dollar 20 billion per year for the next 20 years in cities in India. If I may tell you that in India, we have 53 cities with population in excess of 1 million. So 1.2 billion is the total population. Now, this investment is more than the investment needed in all other urban services put together, including housing. Roads, of course, take away most of these investments, 70 to 80 percent, because there's a huge deficit in roads. Out of this investment of, for roads, 20 percent is the earmarked for creating facilities for walk and cycle. Public transport requires about 20 to 30 percent. And about 2 percent is for staffing, capacity building, and technology. This, this, this huge investment cannot be funded by any one single source. So a consortium approach has been proposed through a combination of funding from government of India, state government, urban local bodies. As you know, India has a three-level government, central, state, and city. Development agencies, something through property development, and loans from domestic and financial institutions, as well as particip participation of private sector. Now, we have debated extensively on the participation of the private sector, and we find that private sector may not be interested in all projects in urban transport. For example, very few metro rail or rail transit projects would be amenable to uh, privatization because they are, as a rule, not financially viable. Private sector in bus transport is not easy either since fares cannot be high as a matter of public policy. Some of the areas where urban, where private sector intervention is possible are listed at the bottom. ITS, intelligent transport system, automatic fare collection systems, scientific vehicle rickshaws and auto rickshaws, public cycle sharing system, maintenance of roads and infrastructure, and bus stations, depots, terminals, and workshops. We have also developed the financing model for each component of uh, urban transport. Urban rail transit has to be funded primarily by government, but the door has been kept open if somebody feels that their project can be done on a private sector participation basis, they're free to do so. The bus rapid transit system, city bus service, and the public cycle scheme, and the bus depots terminals and workshops. The rule is that infrastructure will be done by the government and operation and maintenance by the private sector. Provisioning, operation and maintenance. Coming to roads and the facilities for walk, cycle, etc. The infrastructure in existing roads has to be funded by the government, upgrade of the infrastructure. Whereas in new roads, this should be done as a part of urban development. 
we have detailed out um, how each component of urban transport has to be funded and what percentage by each. And this is the total estimate for contribution by different, as I said, there is a consortium approach, who contributes how much. If you look at the first two items, central government and state government development authorities, you will see that 50% of the funding has to be done by the government. And the balance is by the private sector and debts, etc. Now, all these funds which are raised should not go astray. They must remain and must be used for urban transport. So there is a proposal to create a national urban transport fund. Now, where does it get the money from? We have adopted three principles to determine the sources. That the source must produce a high impact, that means in terms of annual contribution, it should produce a substantial contribution. Polluters pay principal, that means whoever pollutes more should pay more, and should reduce the use of personal vehicles, because that is the ultimate objective. <clears throat> and the three sources which qualify are a green surcharge of rupees two and petrol sold across the country. Diesel was not considered because it is used for purposes other than transport, a green cess on existing personalized vehicles, an additional 4% of the vehicle's insured value, and urban transport tax on purchase of new cars and two-wheelers, 7.5%, and on diesel vehicles, 20%. You'll see that these fund, these three sources generate enough funds to meet the investment requirements. Um, even though the green surcharge on petrol is very small, the other two sources are very big. And they fully cover the investment needs of urban transport. It is not enough to say where do you get the money from, but the process of collection has to be also firmed up. And we find that the green surcharge on petrol can be collected by oil companies in India through their retail outlets because it's all documented. Green cess on existing personalized vehicles can be done through insurance companies. And the urban transport tax on purchase of new vehicles will be at the point of sale. A similar fund has to be created at the state and city level and the funding sources will be land monetization, betterment levy, land value tax, enhanced property tax, grant of development rights. These are all functions within the, um, within the authority of the state and the city government. When, when estimating the investment needs for urban transport, the the committee went a little further and they found that the need for investment can be reduced by 30% if appropriate policy interventions are made to promote sustainable urban transport. And the main policies which interventions which have been suggested are listed here. The first one is compact cities, mixed land use pattern and transit oriented development. As you know, urban transport is a derived demand, depends on the urban growth policy. If the urban growth policy can be, can be such that the transport demand is controlled, then it can be met also. The second was that the public transport must take, can constitute 60% of the motorized trips. This is an average for the entire country. Third is to promote the Public transport, last mile connectivity is essential. And there has to be effective integration. To promote the walk and cycle, it was said that citywide facilities should be created, infrastructure should be created. And the committee has gone a step further because these two things are so far neglected. 
And they said that funds for major transport infrastructure will be linked to achieving targets for creating facilities for walk and cycle. So that it is not just left as it is. Cycle rickshaw has been given an important role for the last mile connectivity. And of course, clean and efficient vehicle technology. Some fiscal instruments have been proposed to control the use of motorized vehicles. That means discourage motorized vehicle, first ownership by imposing taxes, second use by taxing vehicle and road use, like congestion pricing and all that. And encourage use of low emission technology and innovations through subsidies and tax rebates. Now, to, to implement all these policies, the committee has fixed goals for the next five years. And these are these 10 goals. <coughs> sorry. First, to relate to institutional strengthening, because the institutions to manage urban transport at present in our country are very weak. And to build capacity of state and city officials, because the, unless the planners know how to plan, the objective won't be achieved. The next two points are for non-motorized transport. And then the fifth point is about the augmentation of public transport. Here the targets have been fixed, linked with the population, what kind of public transport should be provided. For example, a million population city, it has been said, should have a bus rapid transport. Then the road infrastructure, because roads is the main infrastructure for urban transport used by everybody. So that has to be upgraded and improve safety through safety audits, security as well. The use of technology should be promoted. Funds have been kept aside for this purpose in the plan and to promote innovation, research, and R&D. Now, it is also essential to measure the benefits or measure the where we have reached and to measure and monitor the impact of investments. 10 service level benchmarks have been issued by the government with 37 indicators. These are listed here, public transport, pedestrian facilities, non-motorized, that is cycle, rickshaw, and bicycle, level of usage of intelligent transport system, travel speed, availability of parking spaces, road safety, pollution levels, integrated land use transport system. As I mentioned, this is the key, and financial sustainability of public transport. Because if it is not financially sustainable, it will decline, and the demand will increase. So there are four levels of service level service indicated there, and cities are expected to progress by one stage every five years to reach the top service level in 20 years. Technology, a lot of emphasis is there is there on the, in the plan to introduce technology, to use technology for traffic management, multimodal integration, enforcement, and vehicle inspection. <laughs> a phased implementation plan has been prepared for introduction of technology. Because you see, the, the technological maturity of the organizations in the cities has to be taken into account. If you suddenly introduce a complete set of technology measures, they may not be able to maintain it. And the costs have been estimated for doing this. Finally, to, to be able to do all this, institutional arrangement is important. As I said, the institutions today to manage urban transport in Indian cities are very weak. So roles have been assigned that the central government will do the capacity building policy and research and development. The state government will empower the city with legislation and resource generation policy because unless the city can raise resources, it cannot implement. And professional staff, because today they don't have any professional staff. In cities, there will be a three-level arrangement. 
MPC and DPC means there is a Metropolitan Planning Committee, which is intersectoral committee. It is urban transport, urban development, everything else. And where in small cities, it's a district planning committee. UMTA second tier is the United Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority, so that it can take care of all the functions, all the components of urban transport. And the existing city agencies continue in their role of implementation, operation, and maintenance. <coughs> AMTA is proposed to be a full-time professional body working under a city council with control of funds. Because unless this organization is given the teeth, people will not listen to it. So to conclude my presentation, I want to say that the importance of green growth in urban transport is fully appreciated, as is the need to think innovatively. In India, we have given it a lot of thought, and all aspects have been considered and guidelines done. Estimates of investments, means of generating funds, transformative policies, monitoring mechanism, technology deployment, institutional framework, in fact, capacity building has already started. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Singal. And uh, as uh, he takes his seat, can you just give me an indication of how many people would like to come in with questions or comments and so on uh, in response to that presentation? So we have one there. And well, we've got a couple. OK, good. Um, I think the first thing to observe is that you, I mean, you've presented a really model plan for how to go about uh, greener growth in the transport sector in, in the urban environment and how to finance it. Um, and I just wanted to ask how much is still at the planning stage and how much is actually happening and starting uh, with the, the, the financing. Uh, you talked about three new taxes and, and for anybody that didn't get it, assess is an Indian word for, or it was a British word, but the Indians keep it and the Brits have forgotten to use it, which means a tax. Um, so that's a tax on the purchase of, uh, of new vehicles. So I wonder if the CES and the other two taxes are introduced now or are still uh, just an idea. Now these inputs, I mean, uh, these, these sort of recommendations or proposals were prepared by a committee appointed by the government on urban transport. And uh, these inputs have gone into two main um, policy reports. One is into the 12th five-year plan. In India, we have the planning is all controlled under five-year plans. And this is the 12th five-year plan, which has started, just started. So these inputs have gone into that. The final document of the 12th five-year plan has to come out. So hopefully, a lot of this will be there in that plan. The other committee was in the National Transport Development Policy Committee, which was required to lay down policy for the next 20 years in all sectors of transport. And this recommendation has gone, in for, gone into that, and that final document is nearing completion. So at this stage, you can take it, it is a, it's a plan, it's a proposal, and we'll have to wait and see how much of it comes out in the final documents, and then implementation starts. I think the, the, the starting point, equitable allocation of space to the different categories of users, is what drives the whole plan, and that's a real cornerstone of having a green transportation system. Um, but this implementation, getting public acceptance now, uh, or the ministers to agree to introduce new taxes, it's a challenge in most countries. I don't know uh, what you think the prospects are in India of actually getting these through. I mean, it's a great plan with a lot, a long way to go in India to uh, transform the cities as we know them today. See, these taxes are, do not affect the common man. They're all on vehicles. The people who can afford cars and other things can perhaps pay a little more. So that acceptability part of it perhaps is not, not a matter of concern. 
Okay, that's that's a good point. I was thinking of uh, reforms to the railway sector, uh, which were put through a year ago, about a year today, where um, rail transport uh, in the urb, getting people into work in the cities, but also long distance transport is very dependent on, on the railway system, which is uh, suffers from chronic underinvestment. And one of the reasons why is that the fares for using the system for the public are kept very low. And a year ago, uh, there was a very sensible recommendations to increase the fares. The minister raised them a little bit, and he had to resign three days later because of the protests uh, <laughs> that resulted in a coalition government that you know, doesn't have such strong authority to resist uh, public uh, opinion. But as you say, uh, perhaps the middle class will be a little bit more tolerant of uh, paying their fair share. Yeah, you see the point is that, that all the trouble starts when public transport tries to increase fares, as you said. And that is, but what we are talking of here is capex, the capital expenditure. And um, in the plan, provision has also been made for um, ongoing subsidies and uh, things of that type. So that, see, once the system is in place, when the infrastructure is in place, the services are in place, they have to in fact not decline but grow with the growth in demand. So in these plans, we attention has also been paid how to keep up the ongoing costs. And yes, you brought us on to the remarks that you made um, that you see the public finance as taking the majority of the share of investments in the transport sector. And I think that's not just true in the urban environment, but across, across the board. Um, because of the need for ongoing subsidy and the increasing, uh, the increasing financing need in something like a railway or, a, or an underground railway. And I, maybe I could just use that uh, to bring in one or two of the points that uh, Veolia would have made today if they, if they had been able to be here, because I think they would have taken issue with you there, because their business model depends very much on private sector investment into transport, both in buses and uh, metro railways, uh, within a framework that works for them, the framework set by the government. Uh, and what they wanted to say is that the, because public finance is short, particularly now in the financial crisis, uh, they see an increasing need for private, leverage private investment. And by that they mean uh, the green, green funds being set up by government to jointly finance um, public-private partnerships. Um, what they see is a need for government to channel resources, um, principally because of the nature of the investments there for projects that last for 20 years or 30 years and don't cover their capital investment costs until perhaps year 15 onwards. Uh, and the private sector alone uh, almost never can make that kind of uh, very long-term uh, investment. They need to see some kind of return for shareholders in the shorter term. So the government then has two options to put in uh, a capital subsidy, so come up with some of the cash uh, for the investments at the beginning, or commit to quite a high level of ongoing annual uh, payments to the, uh, the project over time. Uh, and Veolia uh, sees both as parts of the equation for getting uh, sustainable private equity into, uh, into the, tr the transport investment. Um, they also uh, discussed government needing to do something about uh, various risks involved uh, with this kind of investment. Um, covering the revenue gap, as I said, covering currency risks, covering project risks, and particularly addressing revenue risks. And Jay Hack, maybe I can bring you in here in just a moment. Um, if you look at the history of public-private partnerships uh, in transport uh, investment in countries that have done a lot of them, including the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, which are the two, uh, and France, uh, the three leading countries. Um, there are a lot of cases where the revenues turn out to be not as high as forecast. So the money that's collected either through tolls on a motorway or through the fare box uh, in an underground railway 
fall short of the, of the forecast. And at that point, the promoter has to go back to the government and say they need some additional funding, uh, which is a very uh, politically unpopular thing to do and causes the minister great stress. But uh, usually he goes ahead and provides the extra funding because abandoning a very high profile uh, transport investment uh, is a very difficult thing to do politically. Um, so I know there's been quite a bit of controversy over the way governments guarantee revenue payments to private investors in Korea. And Jay Hack, is there any insights you can bring to the Korean experience of what's the future potential for using this kind of uh, investment instrument? I think the <clears throat> about two months ago, I, I attended a seminar. Uh, I attended a seminar uh, where the, the KDI the researcher uh, presented about the, some experiences and the guidelines uh, from the Korea's uh, the PPP, PPP related. And then the conclusion is very interesting. Conclusion is that if you are not ready, don't do PPP. That, that is his, uh, his uh, recommendation. Means the, the PPP project is very, very complicated process. If you are, if, if you are the, what is the uh, preparation, negotiation, systems is not ready for implementation, for execution, and then it is a very risky process. And then eventually it will go into the, some, some chaos or some pu public debate, public opposition, etc., etc. Same, same now happening, uh, already happened or is happening now in Korea. And then actually the, I think it, one of the biggest problem is the, the, the short of revenue uh, than expected or to be forecast. To, to be forecast. And then uh, I think we, uh, we think the, the we first thing is uh, either government or private sector or local government or, or the, the public, they, they have to understand, they have to know what, what is the true, what is true. But the interesting thing is nobody uh, talking, nobody, nobody wanted to talk about the truth. And then everybody avoid truth, you see? Escape truth, something like this. Huh? So the, uh, the, I think it's the most important thing is transparency. I, I think that the, in order to overcome the, what is the, 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 the problems, obstacles of PPP, we have to make system transparent. That is most important, I think. Uh, 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 in my personal opinion, I think it's the PPP is the necessary and also important financing method for future transport investment. Not only the general transport, but also green growth. I think so. The uh, I we, we we still. PPP is under, under severe, severe criticism, but I think there is a long way or the quite promising the future for PPPs, for the transport investment in the future, I think. Well, I think uh, Violia, Violia speaker, if he was here, would definitely agree with you on that. I think the uh, difficult thing is that investors, not so much the banks giving short-term loans and getting their money back quickly, but long-term investors that put equity into uh, investments, uh, the kind of uh, pension funds, insurance funds that were being talked about in the session, the plenary session just before, uh, they see infrastructure as already a risky uh, investment, even conventional infrastructure, never mind uh, more green growth orientated infrastructure that may involve electric vehicles, uh, novel technologies and so on. Um, and they need some kind of gar government guarantee on the revenues they'll get back if they're to put their money into this even riskier category, uh, which is green growth. So I think uh, what we can take away 
from that is that uh, there's a potential for private equity to come into uh, green transportation infrastructure investment, but under a transparent, as you said, JHAC, framework of the government that makes it very explicit what they're going to cover. And they have to sell that to the electorate because uh, if things go wrong and they have to refinance and it costs a lot more than originally foreseen, the, electric, the, the electors are not very tolerant of that happening unless they've already bought into why are we doing this in the first place. So I think there's a big effort the governments have to make to put over what they're trying to do in getting private equity into the transport sector. It may be much trickier than with uh, solar panels or, uh, or wind farms, but even there we've seen as feed-in tariffs have been scaled back, a lot of controversy as companies go bust, what should government do? Should it carry on subsidizing when it's short of money because of the financial recession? Yeah, it's not easy. But perhaps we can come to the two questions that we had. Nope, you're... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry to have stolen <laughs> what you want to say. Did anybody else uh, want to come in? Yes, over here. The microphone's just coming. My name is Mahoshi. I'm from the uh, National Treasury in South Africa. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Singhan regarding the urban uh, strategy that um, you say is under discussion. I hear you focusing a lot on road transport. Um, you're focusing a lot on road transport. Um, I wanted to find out whether the strategy encompasses the other sectors, um, rail uh, being one of, 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 of the sectors, because um, the one thing that um, we experienced in South Africa is that uh, for a number of years, focus was very much on road transport, and the incentives that were provided were, were mainly towards um, uh, um, lowering the costs of transportation. But what was ignored was the capital expenditure, I mean the maintenance of, 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 of the roads. And as a result, because um, um, that's where the incentives were, a lot of transportation moved back to the roads. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on the roads uh, as a result. Um, um, and now it's only now that government is, is looking at at rail transportation, particularly for urban transportation, to try and minimize um, the, 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 uh, the impact on road transportation. So I just wanted to find out from your side whether you're only focusing on road transportation. And um, I think the question for the moderator, I, 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 have a, I, I don't know when we talk about green transportation and looking at the private sector coming into green transportation, what will bring the private sector in? In there because I don't know outside um, working and creating walkways <laughs> what what else do you do that that will attract uh, private sector in investment um, we are having uh, challenges and you're quite correct uh, 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 that in the long term with with for example um, uh, PPPs in transport is that you have a revenue gap that you need to fill because tolls are not um, able adequately able to cover that and we find that um, because and for most developing countries you do not have a um, a regulator per se independent regulator for transportation then it becomes a tussle between policy and the private sector in terms of how do you match that and and the question is where do you provide the incentive is it to the um, um, is it to the people or is it to the private sector and that is that is where we are in South Africa, as an example, with tolling in the, in the, in the um, road transportation. Um, if you are referring to the figure I gave, 70 to 80 percent in the roads, it is not in roads transportation, but roads infrastructure. As I said, there is a huge deficit in the roads in our cities. The committee estimated the deficit as 50 to 80 percent in the existing road network. The second thing is that the balance 20 to 30 percent, which I've said is for transportation, it has both road and rail transport. Now you have to look at it from the point of view of the number of cities that need in India. We have got, as I said, more than 50 cities 
with a population in excess of 1 million. And out of that, maybe there are 5 or 6 cities only which can support rail transit. Others are the smaller cities. The smaller means about a million population. And they cannot support rail transit. So, so that is why you find that some distortion in the figures which I projected. In looking at it in for all cities in the in this thing. And if I may add, one, not on this one, but another comment on the question of uh, uh, subsidies. We have developed a gross cost model to introduce bus services. Now let me explain that because uh, the objective is to promote public transport. And public transport this can be promoted only if it provides quality service. A service comparable to let's say a rail transit or a metro rail. Now that is possible, that is not possible if you put everything on the private sector person. So the gross cost model says that the private, the infrastructure of course is done by the government. The buses and operation and maintenance is done by the private sector. And he quotes if a, a cost of doing that. The revenue risk is taken by the government. That means the government collects the revenue but pays to the private sector person for the kilometers that he operates. So something like per kilometer rate. So that the quality of service is maintained, the objective of promoting public transport is achieved. And the private sector is happy to operate and get his payment based on the kilometers he has run. So we are, we are trying to, the, this committee promotes that. In fact, it, that is why, you know, the private sector participation is low and the government participation is high. Because the government has also accepted that in rail transit, subsidies are a necessary evil. You cannot survive without subsidies. So that is why the government contribution is at almost 50% level. Yes, and that's certainly experience in, uh, in just about every country, uh, and I'm sure South Africa too, that you need uh, the government to pay for the public service obligations that it would like to impose on private operators, and that's, that's the only way that you can provide mass public transport services. It's, call it a subsidy, but in fact it's the government purchasing a service uh, on behalf of citizens because it's something that's very difficult to organize in a purely private system. Just uh, in response to the question on why should you use public-private partnerships at all, um, yeah, I have a lot of sympathy for that. Um, and it, I think the answer comes down to there are some projects that work much better than others. And if you imagine uh, a bridge in a very busy uh, motorway system as a kind of missing link over a major river. On that kind of link, it's a fairly easily identified project. There's no alternative routes. Um, and you have strong and fairly predictable demand because it's part of a, an established network. In there, you're not taking very many risks. And the private sector can put its money in and be fairly confident to get a return. And those kind of situations, they rarely go wrong. Um, they don't have to be refinanced. If you're trying to put in an urban uh, route, an urban freeway, uh, where there's a lot of parallel routes, a lot of interconnection, it becomes a very unpredictable situation. And classically, that's the kind of uh, toll road that fails and goes bankrupt. The uh, three tunnels in Sydney, uh, for example, in, over the last couple of years went bust because they were part of these dense uh, urban networks. But I think now it's time to turn to Cambodia. And Mr. Yutea uh, is going to give us uh, the view of green, uh, green growth in transport viewed from Cambodia and some of the achievements they've made to date. Uh, actually, first I'd like to say I, it's a great honor for me to be one of the discussion for the uh, Green Growth Summit uh, 2013 um, under the team Financing Green Growth Plan with special emphasis on transport. Uh, at the most outset, allow me to highly value the uh, the effort that uh, Global Green uh, Global Green Growth Institute uh, to bring about this uh, summit, and I think it's a very uh, it's a world class think tank 
where we can share view, experience, and best practices in the um, in the on the world hot topic that is uh, a sustainable transport or sustainable growth or green growth, if you wish. Before we we start, I start my we have start our. Allow me to share with you my country views and achievement that we have with respect to transport. I think climate change is a controversial challenge that the, uh, is discussed across the globe. And I think this might be a rationale behind the appearance of the word green growth. A common question has been asked to what extent and how the climate change can be addressed. While we are thinking of every effort we should pursue to reduce CO2 emission exposure into the atmosphere. Transport accounts for 23% world total emission, as you already know. And many governments committed to reduce by 50% by 2050. So what, how, and who should do about it? The government plays a leading role, I believe, in this respect. They can issue pragmatic and realistic policy, rule, and regulation toward that. Many governments have done so. I believe Cambodia has done its part. They're promoting public transport, the use of, of ITS, building an integrated road network, applying high standard CO2 emissions, introducing tram or metro, encouraging the use of environmental friendly vehicle, including waterway transport. Further, they establish strong policy framework that prioritize sustainable development projects and programs, including national funding program to implement. They attract in private investors, financing by ensuring viable regulatory and legal environment, appropriate design and structure of market, and long-term incentive for private investment. They provide technical training, knowledge resource, and policy guidance to local community. To build the capacity for impact bias analysis at the lo local level, thanks to their political will and commitment. Regrettably, this only exists in some country, not all depend on their economic circumstances. So the question is being asked, how to help those countries who have not done so to have low CO2 emission policy apply? Just now I heard the Minister of Environment from Mongolia. She spoke about the, her government incentive to the investment on the renewable energy. I really appreciate that policy. And I think this should be, uh, this is a, is a very good case in point for the other, other countries. The financial institutions are playing a role in financing the government or developer to build roads and the manufacturer to build, manufact the, to build factories. They are not apart from the solutions. They can introduce strong policy framework or scheme that prioritize green growth project in investment program. Should there be such a scheme, I believe project and program will be streamlined with the green growth or sustainable growth. The manufacturer and the transport mode producer are perhaps a grassroots of the solutions. The car, for example, 
emit more or less CO2 depending on them. So can the manufacturer produce car, for example, which emit less or none CO2 by way of using renewable energy yet reasonably, reasonably on market price? I really appreciate the in invention of new innovative technology, electric, hybrid, NPG or LPG, eco start stop functions, though they are not yet that reasonable price in life as compared with ordinary car for the user. And owing to that, they are not that so attractive to the user, especially in the developing countries. So can you make this type of car attractive or the technology cannot afford to do so? This is a question. The user are generally motivated by the government and manufacturers. They might not care but respect rules and regulations. What they want is to have convenient and affordable transport means. But one important thing that they should not dismiss is that they are in no way apart from the environmental solutions. But is it already absorbed by all users? The answer is simply no. Last week, uh, last year, I met a friend of mine. He bought a car, a hybrid car. And he told me that he was told if he used that hybrid car, he can save about $500 per month. But just a few weeks before I came here, I met him again, I, and he sold his car. I asked him why. He said at the beginning, the consumption price and the cost for consumption is definitely low. But, but several months later, he has to bro brought this car to the maintenance. And then he said, the maintenance cost is extremely high. So this is, a, this is the, 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 what the, 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 user car, the user think about. This is a very good example. Now, what Cambodia has, uh, has been achieved so far? We are small countries, and we are least developed countries. We are not source of the problem. I mean the environmental problem. But we are very mindful of the issue. This is a political will and virtue that the government is holding toward the world. From that perspective, the Ministry of Public Work and Transport where I am working for has been implementing a green growth principle via the following. Build an integrated road network to smoothen the flow of vehicle, goods and people in an efficient manner. Set up a speed limit of 90 km per hour to ensure the effective combustion of fuel consumption. We impose periodical technical vehicle inspections every two years. We promote the use of railway as we believe that it is the most efficient in economic mode of transport. Not to mention about the very friendly mode of transport to the environment. And I think you all know. I we also reduce a traffic jam. We're installing light traffic, media, and fly flyovers. We grow trees along the road to help reduce CO2 emit from the vehicle, especially in the urban area. As the way forward, the Ministry of Transport will continue to be obliged by the environmental safeguard principle by implementing as follow. Continue to implement the action state above. We cooperate with interested development partner to modernize the traffic management, especially ITS. 
we look for interest development partner to murder, to implement the tram project in the capital. The feasible study of the tram has been complete by French company, and now we are bringing, we are looking for the investor to cooperate with our government in this particular uh, transport. We also look for development partner to carry out Phnom Penh Lok Ninh Railway project. I think maybe James, he knows about that. Uh, I have made a presentation to the, uh, I think the first or second and second as, as, as in our case, uh, senior transport official conference. And uh, I, we, 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 we are looking forward to seeing the, uh, 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 the, the Korean company if, to, to invest in this uh, project. We promote the use of public transport in the big city. And I, I just now I already have a chit chat with our panelists that we in uh, 10 years back, we, we introduced a, a bus system in Phnom Penh in uh, the, uh, the, the capital of Cambodia. But then it was well, because there are two reasons. The first, because of the uh, limited line of the bus. Second is compared to the uh, 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 traditional uh, way of transport is it is expensive. When I heard uh, Dr. Mr. Singhal from India talk about the surcharge on the, uh, we, we, the, the we can think of uh, he said we can think of uh, the have a tax uh, the, on the fees. I, I don't know whether it's work in Cambodia or not. But because the public transport is must be very cheap in the first place. Because in developing countries like Cambodia, we use the so-called moto, motorcycle to bring people from one place to another, and it's considerably cheap. And the, it, this one is a door-to-door -door transport. So from, from the, the shop, straight to the, 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 the door of their house. So it's very convenient. All those, of course, is risky in terms of accident. But in terms of congestion, I must say, motorbike is still very reasonable. So the public transport, if we introduce, in the first place, we think, have to think of the cost of the ticket, the price of the fee. The second is the coverage. It must, it must uh, have a several line uh, crossing the main street, if, if you like to have that success. We will encourage and promote the use of the green innovative technology in transport. We will promote and encourage the use of waterway transport between city and city, especially those which are uh, along the Great Lake and the Mekong River. We will improve the regulation and rule on the management of road and waterway transport based on the experience and best practices of the international agencies such as IMO, IEA, ITF, and others. We will strengthen cooperation with countries and the international agencies in the, in the region and the world to share information, experience, and resource to undertake green growth principle. To end this note, I think I, I would stress that the reduction in CO2, I think, is a, is a, a hot topic that has been discussed in the, in, across the globe, uh, require a strong commitment and will from the government, financial institutions, manufacturers, and users. If we all commit together, we'll be able to grow together. Yet we can green our children. Let's have our economy growth be driven by the environment. Thank you. Well, I, what we'll do is uh, stretch the session by 15 minutes to make up for the 15 minutes late start which gives us uh, time for Jay Hack's presentation properly. May, could I ask you to hold questions that you have until at the end, and then we take them together for efficiency. And uh, I think one thing that we uh, picked up from that presentation is that green growth in transportation 
also needs to include clean motorcycles as, uh, as probably a very important part of the equation, something that's often missed. So, Jayhack, uh, over to you to hear from a uh, country at the other end of the spectrum uh, on the technology aspect, um, if you'd like to take your presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we don't have much time. Hmm? Uh, I'd like to uh, speak, talk about the, more about the innovative technologies. So the, Mr. Singh, Singhal, he, he said the, 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 what is the, the officials was, uh, Designed over the increase of the transport fare, so it the means the some the some market market pricing policy or some regulations uh, are not uh, are not popular to public, huh? or the Mr. Rang uh, you say uh, he told the. Uh, technology is good, but uh, it should be uh, affordable or viable to use. I think so. Uh, following the such such the what is the stream, I like to uh, the introduce about the some innovation output uh, on in in transport technologies or systems for green growth. Uh, As you already know very well, the ultimate goal of green growth uh, is to promoting uh, economic growth at the same time in the environmental conservation by creating new growth engines uh, such as the green technologies or, and industries uh, and also contributing to global greenhouse gas reduction effort basically. So here we say the new growth engines, uh, but uh, green technologies and in the industries. Uh, but usually when we say new growth engines, uh, that is only for the developed countries. I don't, I don't think so. So we, we may also uh, develop some, creating some technologies or growth engines uh, for useful for developing countries as well. Uh, as you uh, imagine, uh, the transport uh, transport sector, transportation sector, account for 20 to 20, 23 percent of the of CO2 emissions. This is varying from country from country to country. Uh, given the rapid uh, growth in car ownership, especially in India other Asia or China, uh, the influence of the transport sector on climate change will become even more important, I think. So if we don't any, uh, what is the, the radical what's measures, uh, take the radical measures, uh, and then the, it, it will go up as the car ownership increase. Uh, among various, there, there, there are various measures uh, already, uh, like as the, the, what is the introduced by the Mr. Singer. Uh, there are many, many reduction measures, uh, uh, the, what is the greenhouse gas reduction measures, uh, and then, but we can classify into three categories. One is avoid, second is shift, and the third is improve. Uh, and then among among three uh, three uh, measures, uh, I think it's the the improve. Improve is the improve is uh, mostly expected to make the high <coughs> contribution to CO2, CO2 reduction. Uh, improve is especially related to 
uh, technologies related to improve the fuel efficiency, green vehicles, and and also the eco eco driving uh, is a is a big area for the high 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 impact on CO2 reduction. Uh, let take some the pri take let us the pri 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 prior Prioritize the various measures. Uh, one one is the public x axis represents the public compliance, and the horizontal axis is the cost and efficiency. Uh, if you see these these tables, the technology assisted measures are also is the usually uh, the characterized as high compliance. In, in other words, they are more socially acceptable, can, can be implemented without big public opposition. So the, if you impose uh, technology-driven measures, you are not necessarily to resign because of the public opposition, you see? So here is the high public compliance is the eco driving is the low cost high efficiency. Low for low cost low efficiency is the ITS still very good, but high cost high efficiency is the improving fuel efficiency, promoting green vehicles. As the the Mr. Lang Lang mentioned, this is very expensive area, and the high cost low efficiency is the bio. Biofuels. Uh, I'm not going to, to introduce. I'm not going to much explain about this. This is the technology evolution, uh, going the going back to 19th centuries. Uh, as you see here, looking back on the history of the transport evolution since the industrial revolution, we can identify by chance, by chance. Uh, 50-year cycles in new innovations to the transport systems, starting with the canals, peak in mid of the 19th century, and then railway, and then road, and then airplane, and then the what what is the what is the the what is the next uh, technology, next uh, the what is the innovative transport system? which governing next 50 years, we don't know yet. Maybe high-speed railway or some the electric vehicles, I don't know. But uh, I, I showed this graph to, to somebody in, in World Bank and then some railway, very famous railway expert said, uh, told me, railway is coming back. So it's, railway is not all the technology said. Okay, we can up, uh, the, you know, renovate it. Uh, railway technology, and then make it uh, another new technology, innovative technology for the future. Uh, major changes that lead to the future, I, I say three, three things. Uh, energy system, energy crisis, and climate change is important as we gather today. Urban structure is also very important because of the rapid urbanization, high density urban redevelopment. Uh, also, technology convergence, uh, IT, vehicle, the infrastructure, is, uh, the convergence is very important. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce uh, uh, some, what is the, some interesting seven uh, the, what is the research outcomes uh, for, for the green transport. Uh, actually, most of them are, what is the, Studied by the by the Korea Transport Korea Transport Institute, and but uh, but these these technologies is is just the output of the research and development. It's not implemented yet. So the I just uh, we can just taste what is the innovation, future innovation in transport systems or transport technologies. I don't say something very difficult or something very big, okay? 
I just small things, but it might be very useful for our daily life, daily transport systems activities. Uh, first one is the, the BRT with the online electric vehicles. Uh, this, this technology is a BRT with online electric vehicle. The bus rapid transit the BRT is the powered from the underground power lines and the battery capacity reduced to one pips. Usually the electric cars are, are, are having troubles with the huge heavy the batteries, battery weight. The construction of power line load means on, on road is only required on 20% of the entire PLT route. And this technology actually was developed by the KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Technology Science, but uh, uh, the KOTI, our institute, Korea Trans Institute and the KAIST uh, jointly uh, trying to implement this technology to the, to the, what is the, the in urban areas. It's now on the, the model development stage. This one looks slightly funny. We call it a uh, BIRT, Bike Rapid Transit. This second technology is the, the bike rapid transit with a non-stop elevated bikeways. Bikes can move faster during the rush hours. And such structures are unaffected by severe weather conditions. So the, this is, a, what is the, like a freeway, elevated freeway, but the, also the, covered by some tube. So the, it's not unaffect, it's, it's unaffected by the weather conditions. So it might be good some, some countries with a very harsh weather conditions. But it's a slightly expensive. And this is the, the cloud transport systems. Uh, you know already the Jeep car or uh, some Fuji cars. Uh, they are basically the car sharing, car sharing system. But here is, I, I say, is a cloud transport system, uh, which is the, which is taken from the, the cloud computing. Yes, and uh, I here is the cloud, cloud trans, the, the innovative point of the cloud transport system is to uh, combine car sharing and the public transport systems through some the intermodal journey planning or reservation service. So the, uh, in, in, in the uh, two or three years ago, ago in Leipzig, there was uh, some, some the discussion about the car sharing, but the car sharing means the, it, the, what is the, the system of car sharing, the, what is the, 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 the might uh, encourage it use more cars, taking out more, more vehicles into the road. So the, what, what here is the, we just combine the car sharing and the public transport. So car, cars are taking part, take part in the, what the public transport cannot afford. This is the idea. So the, I think it's the public, the car sharing should be might be more successful, more effective for, for green growth uh, when it is combined with the public transport more effectively. That, that is the idea. And uh, another thing is the, usually the, in many countries uh, for green growth, uh, you are, uh, the railway investment is uh, quite often encouraged. But the uh, railway uh, Railway investment usually very much the, what is the, disturbed by the low, low what is the ridership. You see, in many 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 countries, even in Korea, we we invest railway lines, railway network, but the, usually it is far about 20 percent, maybe 20 30 percent of of the what is the demand. To be to be focused. That is a very big social problems, social debate. But the, so the the what is the, the remedy, the solution for the such the railway what is the, the short short uh, what is the, the ridership from the railway investment is the 
is to promote the intermodal interchange or connectivity center. You see? So the, the, by the remodeling layout or transport facilities or smart phone based travel information or some efficient management of transport technologies. So it's the railway station or bus terminals is very important. So it is very important to upgrade such a nodal facilities for higher usage of the main line. And uh, it's the technology driven eco driving. Eco driving, you, you know already very well. So, eco driving is the very, uh, is a very uh, low cost, but uh, it's very effective, high efficiency technology. So, it's the, this technology, eco driving technology, encourages drivers uh, to practice uh, eco driving rather than voluntarily cooperation. So, if you say, okay, Let's do it, but the people don't follow it. So it's the technology-driven system is very effective. So this is a low-cost but high-efficiency technology. Uh, this, on a, this technology is the expressway reservation system. Uh, this is slightly funny. The, this technology is to introduce a reservation system for expressways. Usually the airline or railway is using the based on the reservation, reservation system. But uh, why not for the expressways? Uh? So we are, with, uh, with the aid of the ICT technologies, uh, we are trying to introduce uh, express uh, reservation system for the, for the, for the, for the, for this, the highways, expressways, uh, to tackle extraordinary peak traffic demand for road uh, with limited capacity. So in the in Korea, some the for example some the some holiday season might be uh, in in holiday season this system might be very useful. But uh, I like this uh, this uh, this innovation policy system, but uh, strangely, the government uh, don't dare to implement it. Uh, basically. And finally, the automated container transport. Uh, this is a simple idea. Uh, the, what is the, this technology is the, uh, the automated container transport system with a conveyor system using the linear induction motors. Uh, I, I thought, I, I, I came to this idea at first. Uh, the, between the Busan city and the the Seoul capital, a lot of the, a lot of volumes of the, what is the, the container volume, container, the, what is trucks uh, are moving every day, you see? So I calculated, it's about uh, one, about 200, less than 200, 200 meters headway between the, between the, what is the, the container trucks. Uh. So why not uh, use such a, the conveyor belt systems? We, like like this so we we investigated these systems and then the uh, the we we named it the autocon so autocon infrastructure cost less than one third than the railway investment also very effective for fuel saving and the CO2 reduction as well i think uh, i introduced the seven the what is the innovative ideas for transport technologies uh, you, you might be interested in. Uh, okay. Uh, I, 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 I wanted to mention only one, one point. Uh, the I think it's, it is very important to promote, uh, to promote the operational efficiency with the intermodal and the ICT technology. In that sense, uh, expanding BRT network, which is low cost and high efficiency, is very uh, useful, especially compared to railway investment. Uh, so the, for developing countries, uh, it might be uh, very uh, wise and uh, clever investment uh, 
to combine highway construction, highway investment, and uh, what is the bus-based, BRT-based, uh, the public transport systems. You see, and then also useful combined with uh, with uh, some the what is the the operational efficiency uh, improvement uh, with uh, ICT technology. This is. Uh, uh, I, I finished my presentation here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jay Hack. So you've given a, a problem for the railways. They're going to lose their market for containers. And a problem for the politicians. You're going to make them very unpopular when they ration the use of uh, your car on the expressway. Um, we've just got uh, five more minutes we can use. Um, and I just want to throw it open to uh, you, the audience, rather than uh, taking up more of that precious last minutes. Well, if you don't, I did have a question I wanted to put to Mr. Utea. Um, yeah, the, the improving the, the vehicles on the roads in, in Cambodia. Um, stop start is a, I mean, this is a question for Jayhack as well, um, because you put on your graph, you showed that fuel efficiency yeah, yeah. with conventional vehicles mainly, improving the fuel economy of, of the vehicles, improving the engines of petrol and diesel as well as going to hybrids and electricity. But basically, the big savings in CO2 emission are going to come from improvements to ordinary, boring vehicles. Um, Stop-start, though, is, it's, a, it's become quite a cheap technology on a, on a European or American vehicle. Um, seems quite suitable for the dense cities uh, that are developing uh, in, in Asia in particular. Is it really something that's going to be too expensive for the average Cambodian car purchaser, assuming those guys are actually quite the more wealthy people in the, in the society. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yeah, actually, um, I can't say the eco stop start function is expensive or cheap because it just introduced to Cambodia one year. But I can see from the story I told you on my friend bought a, a hybrid car when it comes to maintenance, I'm afraid it will be very costly. This is a question. So we, I, I don't know yet because it's just introduced and no one talk about the problem with this uh, function. But I'm a f what I really, uh, pre uh, I'm really uh, concerned is when it comes to, to maintenance, how it will be. So I, I cannot... Uh, tell you that it's a cheap or expensive in my country but I can raise uh, I can I have an example from motorbike actually the motorbike they have introduced this uh, function already but the cost of that uh, motorcycle is about is more expensive than the regular one I don't know maybe the other function they introduced to the new mo motorcycle uh, type but one of the new technology introduced is the Eco stop and start function, but it costs uh, around three thousand US per vehicle per motorcycle, whereby the uh, the ordinary or the ordinary one costs only two thousand two hundred US, so eight hundred different. It's a very interesting and uh, difficult market because in India, of course, we had the Tato Nano car introduced uh, a couple of years ago. The most basic, cheapest car you could imagine, very low maintenance cost, you could fix it yourself in your garage, and a complete flop because the middle classes in India didn't want to buy a cheap car, they wanted a more expensive car. <laughs> so, not an, easy, uh, not an easy market, and that's where the private sector really does have the expertise, and, but even they can get it wrong, as Tata showed, now slip from number one to uh, number two or three, I think, is in the US manufacturer, uh, the Indian car manufacturers. Uh, and the car, the manufacturers focusing on uh, SUVs in India are the ones that are making the biggest profits, partly because the roads are in such bad condition, everyone, everybody wants an SUV to cope with the bad roads, but mainly for prestige and carrying lots of children in the same way that people do in cities all around the world. Um, so I think we better wrap up uh, so you still get 15 minutes coffee break. Uh, and I think the, answer, the, the one conclusion we need to take away from all of this is that it's very much an, an integrated approach 
I mean, as, as Jay Hack set out in, the, in his presentation, there's a lot of dimensions and they all really need to be addressed in concert if we're to get onto a more sustainable track and not channel investment, government funded uh, subsidized investment into technologies that then prove not to be winners long term. It's uh, very easy to waste money in this area. So maybe that's where the public partnership comes in, is to work, working out using the marketing expertise of the private sector together with the public uh, authorities to channel the public resources into public infrastructure. So thank you for being very patient and staying through to the end. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you to thank our three speakers uh, with a round of applause.